Can everybody hear now? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for being here on this uh, beautiful day. Uh, I'm going to deviate from my normal practice a little bit today. It is a town hall, but I'm going to focus primarily on one topic. A lot of people have asked for some clarity on what's going on with respect to our budget. It seems like we talk about budget a, a lot, but we'll talk about it some more because it is kind of front and center on, every, on everybody's mind. So I'll be talking a lot about the budget. And um, I was thinking about what to say about the budget, and I thought of things that I shouldn't say. I didn't think it'd be help for me, helpful for me to be defensive about this. It certainly wouldn't be helpful for me to blame it on other people, like maybe Jill in the front row here, or, or Bonnie or Ty, something like that. That wouldn't be helpful. Uh, and I'm sure it won't be helpful if I say, I told you so, because I am supposed to be in charge. So I thought the safest thing to do is just tell you like it is, uh, and then we can all go from that point forward. So I plan on just telling you uh, just like it is, uh, there will be a little bit of not I told you so, but I'm going to go back and show you that we did know this was coming. So uh, now it's here. It's a little bit different. So I thought I better start with something very happy. So the first slide is going to come up. This always makes me happy. How many feel good when they walk past this? Everybody does, yeah. yeah. And this was a couple days ago when I was preparing my presentation. It's even prettier right now. So uh, it's town hall, but we're going to talk primarily about budget. And it's not an agenda today because uh, I will go back and forth on topics, but these are kind of the topics that I'm going to cover, and they'll be woven through all the slides. Now, I know some of you are going to be terribly bored. I assume, I shouldn't say I know, I assume some of you are going to be terribly bored because I am going to go through a lot of slides today. I took the animation out of most of the slides, though, so I could go through them faster. And my hope is to only talk about 35 minutes or so uh, and then have the rest of the time for questions. So if I get close to 35, I might accelerate a little bit or just stop short wherever I am uh, and then open it up for us to have a discussion. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start from when I walked in the door and take you up to this morning. OK? Does that sound OK to everybody? Everybody ready for this? OK. All right, so I'm going to move through the budget scenario uh, year by year, and I'm going to use the original slides. I don't want to have any magic or, or moving things around or that, so I'm going to stick with the original slides I used. I did find a typo in one of them, and I fixed the typo. I should have let somebody look at those closer. But essentially, I'm going to use the original slides, and then I've put green text on them to bring to your attention, I'm adding this text so I won't forget what to say on that slide. Uh, and I've also put the dates on most of these slides that we talked about this before. I've also, I got carried away with these arrows, and you'll see a lot of these bright colored arrows in there when I want to bring your attention to something quickly so we don't spend too much time me talking about the slide. Okay? So, and I'm doing it in five years. This is actually the fifth budget I've been responsible for. I'm going to start with year one. Okay. This is before I even got here. So when I came in December, right up here on this stage, December 2014, uh, I presented my short-term and longer-term goals uh, in a slide like this. It's actually two slides. This was the first slide, and then I'm going to show you the second slide. And actually at that time, you'll notice that there's eight points here that I would focus on in my first three months, and a fourth of them, or two of them, have to do with budget preparation. I was going to learn the budget, and assess the resources, capacities, gaps. I knew there'd be gaps. I had just spent four years as provost at an institution very similar in size, with 5,200 students at the time, very similar uh, number of faculty, uh, and we went through kind of a horrible uh, budget reduction scenario because we didn't pay attention. When I walked into that institution, they were adding faculty, everybody was happy, and with the two years later, uh, when the enrollments had gone down and, and uh, funding had kind of slid from the state, we were uh, cutting things. It wasn't very fun. So I paid close attention to this uh, when I uh, interviewed and when I looked at the position, I paid very close attention. So I knew that we'd be looking on this. So the second slide I, I put up was a little bit longer term. So the first slide was the first summer or so I'd be here, first three or four months. This is like almost the first year. And again, 25% 
of the activities I was going to focus on during that time had to do with resource needs, an action plan for the campus, and associated funding. So I told you about these before I got here, and you hired me anyway, uh, which is good. And I stayed true to these things, and I hope you'll see that as we move forward. So this is a new slide that I wanted to tell you uh, a little bit about. So I walked in, and the budget process was underway, because you can't start a budget process in March that's going to be in effect for July 1st. Uh, the folks on campus had started the previous, probably September, and had worked on it, and I walked into something uh, in, in progress, so to speak. That being said, I take full responsibility because I was the CEO. I printed off the uh, ad again today and read it again. It did make it clear. You are the CEO. You're the chief person responsible for the budget. It said it right here, so I knew that. You all knew it uh, at the beginning. Okay. Uh, also, I squeezed in, even at that early time, the necessity of let's start building a little bit of funds into our budget for the strategic plan. And you'll see this kind of come through there. And then I kind of let the budget go as it was and then started concentrating on the next budget cycle. Everybody tracking so far? How many were here in uh, 2015? Most of you were here, okay. So the first thing I did was said that we're going to have a budget process on this campus that is transparent. Not that it wasn't, but it's going to be more transparent and it's going to have more inputs and shared governance. Uh, and we worked together to come up with this diagram, sans green box. The green box wasn't on this regular diagram before I added that. But if you look, it's based on these inputs, a strategic plan, which by the time I uh, got to this, we had launched, not the strategic plan, plan, but the strategic planning preparation. We'd launched that, so I knew we were going to have one, uh, so we needed to get a budget process in place so we could take advantage of that plan. So it had these inputs, external stakeholders, that you've got to have that in Tacoma, uh, and we would have this university budget uh, strategic priorities from our plan, but everybody would be involved. The academic programs, the administrative units would be involved. They would bring it to this executive budget committee and they would make recommendations to me and we would have a process that we would all get to input to. I have to, unfortunately or fortunately, however you look at it, make the decisions, but we put that process into place uh, and we decided who would be on these committees. So all that was put in place before we started all this, okay? And these slides will be available to you if you need them afterwards. So, my second year. First year, remember, was already in progress. We did that second year. So I started really getting worried about our additive habits at this campus when I got here for that first budget process. Uh, I prepared this slide, actually probably Jan prepared this slide for me, and I started talking about it that first year that we had already at that time agreed to $2.2 million of new faculty the previous year. We do faculty approvals a whole year in advance so that we can search for those faculty during that year and they're here in, in place when the time comes that we're expecting to utilize their expertise. So we had already agreed to $2.2 million of new faculty uh, for the coming year when I got here. So I just want to make sure everybody knew about that on campus. I didn't know how much the campus knew about the size and magnitude of some of the decisions we were making in our budget deliberations. Uh, also, we made significant budget additions to staff areas as well. Here is a list that I presented uh, to, in the fall to all the budget committees that talked about the other kinds of things we were adding to campus, and they're pretty big numbers as well. This is on top of uh, faculty lines. And then, I discovered this slide and showed this to campus as well. This is a, 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 a not a conglomeration, but a summative uh, result of the additions we made over three budget years. The, the two years before I got here and the year I got here, this is the sum total of the new additions we made to our campus expenditures. Okay, look at the size of these numbers. Eight million dollars, permanent, doesn't go away. Permanent new funds. 
$11 million of temporary funds. So our reserves were also being used. So we were making decisions using uh, our resources. We had the resources. They were coming. We weren't spending in deficit. We had this money, okay? So don't get me wrong. We weren't doing anything wrong. It's just we weren't preparing to slow this machine down. So I started talking about slow it down. And another thing happened, too, and I didn't know this when I got here. None of us knew it when I got here, was during that uh, spring, they reduced tuition by 10%. That was like, 10% is a big number when you think about our only source of income is tuition and the small allocation the state gives us. And it's a great thing for our students. Uh, I pay tuition for my stepson and will for probably two more quarters, and I appreciate it. It's 10% less than it was before I got here, but it's not good for our bottom line. So I didn't know that, so I started telling campus, this is just my second year, with these assumptions that we're going on, we, as a minimum, will need significant new resources, not to grow and, and move forward, to balance and stay even. Okay, we knew this, we knew this, okay? So we began to build a budget then based on that. So I started saying these things probably like a broken record every time we would uh, talk about this, but then I'm also guilty of moving things forward because uh, we like to move things forward. So uh, this slide, I talked about we need significant new resources. We gotta get new resources to balance and stay even here. We gotta work more closely to match our new faculty hires with where the new enrollment is coming in because by that time I realized that we were sending some students away in information technology and computer engineering in those fields uh, and not adding faculty there. We were adding faculty other places where we maybe didn't have the demand. Started learning about all that. I wanted to put structure into the units. We were doing some odd things like giving people, including my unit, the summer money, which we'll talk about later, and not having accountability for those large sums of money that we were uh, ca calling summer money. I'll talk about that. Um, and we were working on a strategic plan so I was working hard to make sure there was going to be some left over to move the strategic plan forward. So I began to talk about all these things. Uh, so that year, this is 16, 17, we approved a little smaller. You know, it was 2.2 the year before. About half that we approved this coming year, okay, of new hires. And a little bit of way less temporary money because I was also worried about the size of our reserve. Then we began working on year three. So year three, here's where I start getting like a broken record. Uh, year three, I started talking about these same things. Uh, we did work more proactively to get the rest of the campus involved. We did a budget 101. Uh, Harlan and Jan helped put together a, like a, a tutorial package to get people started so more people could understand this and, and you didn't have to take my word for it. We had a larger input from the school. Uh, one of the things that started um, worrying me at that time, though, was the way the state was really reducing what they were doing for us. They were doing good things. They were authorizing us to do 3 and 4% uh, compensation gains, you know, increases in compensation, but they're only paying for a third of that. So if they authorize us to pay 4% salary increases to everybody, but only fund half of that, that puts us back like a million dollars or so. And that was happening in a big way, and I think it was good, and we all enjoyed that, because in the recession, salaries were held constant. Isn't that what happened here for a long time? No raises. So the state's trying to uh, be positive and authorize raises for us, and we had some pretty healthy raises, but they didn't give us the money for that. So I started bringing that to our attention. Uh, and then I put the strategic planning funding in, it looks like a big number, but when you're comparing it to what we were spending on new positions, it's really kind of small. Okay, and then I started equating some of these things to our new students, because new students pay tuition and that's a big source of our income. It's the biggest source of income that we have on this campus. The state allocation is small, so we better be paying attention to that if we are gonna build this kind of enterprise and pay for it. So. Um, You'll see me always showing what the enrollment growth was and what the projections were. I thought it was very good that you all pay attention to this 
And you recall when I came too, there was concern about developing enrollment too quickly. How many remember that? When I came here, I got hit by the interviews. Uh, uh, Deborah Friedman had said we wanted to be 7,000 by seven years, which would be next year, uh, back in, the, in that time. Uh, and the campus was a little worried that that was too much too fast. So I was being asked when I first got here to kind of control that uh, and make sure we had support capacity and not just adding enrollment indiscriminately. So we were focused on that too. So there's a lot of moving parts. So um, this is further along in the year. So I start the budget development in the fall, like next fall and probably October. I'll say a little bit about next year's budget development. We won't know much in October. So usually in February or March when I do a town hall, I can say a lot more because the process is moving along. So this is a slide, uh, that, the slides I'm getting ready to show you of what we talked about in spring 2017, okay? So in spring 2017, uh, we had a, a leadership transition. Um, our finance uh, vice chancellor uh, retired and Jan and Richard uh, were serving as interim vice chancellors for finance. So I asked them if they could prepare me some kind of graphic that I could make this point to campus. You remember preparing this thing? I wanted to try to make this point really clear to campus what was happening with our budget. How many remember this graph? Not very many of you do? Well, I'm gonna show it about three times in the next presentation so you'll remember it after we get done here. So I showed this graph and what it's designed to do is bring to light the fact and I put these years, I violated my little scheme here. I added purple instead of green, but I added these years so you could see it better. What I wanted to do, we were right here at the time, I wanted to show the campus what is going to happen with respect to our income versus our expenditures, okay? It was coming amazingly close over that period of time we were in. So we were getting ready to embark on a, a time in our history where our income was not big enough to keep up with our expenditures. What happens then? Your checkbook goes, you, you get hauled off to the poorhouse. Yeah, so uh, I was wanting to make this clear. Uh, it wasn't gonna happen that year we were in, but it was gonna happen essentially the next year, okay? So we needed to get ready for that. And then I showed this slide again, and I didn't put those arrows on the slide, but when I showed this slide again, I made the new infrastructure a different color and started talking about reallocation. Okay, I started talking about that. That needs to be uh, a word in our vocabulary going forward. So I, I used some of the same materials to talk about the budget, but I got more direct at saying these things. And then we continued to uh, watch our enrollment, and one thing that happened was we had a really banner year. You see, 8%. This is fall 2017. Is this fall 2017? Yeah. Yeah. So we had a, a really banner year. So we had a little breathing room, uh, and that was probably part of, of my problem, not being uh, steadfast in, in keeping us uh, moving forward slowly. So, then also, and the reason I'm showing these slides is I think this was an important development that happened with me. I was uh, in my first meeting in Seattle where Seattle really began to talk about their budget situation. And I felt that since I had gotten here, by this time I'd been here a couple years, I felt that at this university we had been in an uh, era when we actually were very well funded. We went through the, the depression, but actually the, the university was doing very well, 2010, 2015 or so, but really we hadn't planned for the next downturn, which was happening. So I went to a, a I think it was a Board of Regents meeting where I first heard the picture about UW Seattle. And what that told me is, they are not going to be able to help us, you know, and they made that clear. 
uh, and things started happening in Seattle, and you've all read about the dental school. Uh, previous to that, athletics was uh, underwater a little bit. So the U could not really afford to backfill units that weren't uh, financially sustainable. So I brought that message to campus, and that began to, to worry me, and I try to get you to worry about that as well. So um, then I talked about, okay, based on this, what do we need to do on this campus? I said, well, we gotta stick to our strategic plan. We can't be doing 500 other things. We gotta do what we bit off to chew. Uh, we gotta keep focused on that. We need to be clear on our growth agenda. We gotta watch that very, very closely. Uh, new faculty and staff hires, they just have to be limited. We can't afford to continue to add new people when we're having this crossover point. Uh, and then I, I said that we need identified resources. If you want to have a new program, we can, but you've got to bring resources to the table, either through reallocation in your area or ask the state for money. Hence, that's what we're doing for the engineering degrees. Okay? And they delayed our um, Tioga project. So lots of things happened to really slow us down. So this year is the first year then that I really began to clamp down and fund very little. Uh, what I ended up allowing is uh, to take care of the issue in sending students away in information technology. The only two faculty positions I let come through that year were in um, what's now set. Uh, and then we had kind of abused our friends in the library and IT and uh, security by increasing the number of students, increasing the schedule matrix, and not providing the support. So I did authorize a couple half-time positions for a couple areas, and that was essentially it for that year. We did some things for temporary funding. We added to our scholarship pool. Uh, we did uh, an uh, uh, allocation to the Tacoma Ho Child Initiative and a few other things, but we held pretty tight in permanent funding. So now year four. So year four, we were fortunate enough to attract Ty Minkler. You see his name appearing here. Jan and Richard did a great job during the interim period. We brought Ty Minkler on, uh, and my budget preparation started getting a little more scientific, uh, and I started showing slides like this. This is one of the first slides that uh, Ty and his team helped me uh, put together so that I could illustrate to you visually what happened. So this slide really shows what happened, one fatal swoop. You know what that is? That's that 10% reduction. So we're way down here now, and if they are authorizing expenditures uh, in salaries that are 4% or 3% and giving us less than that, that number is actually getting smaller. There's no uh, legend over here. This is just to show the relative value of these two things. We are going down, really, rather than up with respect to our students. So I began showing slides like that. Uh, and then we have the famous crossover slide that uh, all institutions have experienced this. Uh, we did it back at Purdue. Uh, we crossed over there uh, in about 2008 or 9, so a long time ago. So we're actually very uh, blessed here to not experience this crossover until like now. Okay, so this is great. So we started showing folks, and this, this is the way that Dr. Minker likes to show it. This is revenue versus the cost on a per student basis. This is important to look at it this way because uh, what this actually shows you is attracting you know, 10,000 more students isn't necessarily going to help because the cost per student is less than what it, oh, did I say that right? What the revenue per student is less than what it cost us to teach per student. So, you know, you can't just grow your way out of this. And then I showed this slide again. I wanted to make sure people knew we were there. We were at that point. Uh, and then I also began to worry that, uh, okay, people will be concerned about this and they won't want to do the strategic plan. Well, we were off and running on the strategic plan. I had committed to that in the interview. I would committed to that on campus. We had a lot of uh, time and energy put into the plan. It was one thing on campus that everybody seemed to agree with, so I wanted to make sure we didn't deviate from that, so I talked more about the strategic plan. Um, kept our eye on admissions, and we did well. You see, we did start managing it downward a little bit. And then this 
particular spring, after Ty got his feet on the ground, we began to talk about what we're going to do about this. Okay, so everybody tracking so far, we've spent a little more than we should have over a couple of years, and now we're to a point that we have to make a plan on how to manage going forward. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing now. So the short time, we're going to work to push that out and then restructure ourselves, make a structural budget change, uh, and then work on the problem going forward. But we need a little time, okay? So we started doing on that. Uh, I told the campus I was going to be more proactive in building infrastructure for future expansion, and Dr. Minkler was going to lead us in a ground up. He didn't like me using this word that day. He came and told me about it, but that's the word I used at the time, that we were going to work on this together and move forward. And then I would come back. This was in the fall, right? No, this was in February. We would come back soon and tell you how we're going to work on this. This is just over a year ago. Okay, and then at that point, I started really connecting with how important it was that we look at retention as well. It's just not our student enrollment, it's the retention. So we got to look at this number every quarter. And there's a lot of opportunity for us on this campus to improve the retention of the students that come here in the fall and keep them here in the spring uh, and the winter. That's, that's, that's good as gravy as well. That's great to work on the retention because we actually spend more money recruiting students than we do once they're here. So we started paying attention to that. I even did this extra, extra thing to bring attention to that. So then... Ty and myself and the executive team, uh, we kind of developed a plan how we were going to do this moving forward. We were actually going to improve some of our revenue generating areas. We were going to do things including enrollment and then we were going to toe the line uh, and work on our budget to right size it and hold people accountable for it so we wouldn't just grow indeterminately. So I, I tried to show that with this graph. I don't know if it accomplished it but essentially you stretch out the distance between what you're spending and what you're getting in and you have a nice healthy margin and you never cross over that margin, you keep it at 4% and you adjust yourself, makes a lot of sense, okay, to do it that way. And that way, if our margin's healthy enough, we put money in the bank and we can do projects and those kinds of things. So uh, again, I covered, I covered the resulting outcomes that you have to do as a result of that graph you, know, you can't just look at the graph and say we're going to do that. You actually have to make initiatives based on that. We talked about those on campus. Uh, I was really worried about uh, our community not seeing us as a growth agent for this community, so I talked about that uh, as well. And I was really interested in getting the faculty and the uh, uh, academic administration together on an academic plan moving forward. So we'd know what those programs were so that we can add faculty to the programs that we know where there's growth possibilities or where we want to exp uh, expand our portfolio. Again, we talked about enrollment. Always got to talk about enrollment. And then we started on year five. Okay, that's the budget year we're in right now. Okay, so now we're getting down to something that I'm going to have to uh, tell you what happened this year and answer questions about that. So this year, we were working to do just what I showed in that previous graph. So in the town hall, we said this is what it looks like now, but we plan to spread those two uh, graphs apart moving forward, and we're going to tell you how. In the meantime, we looked at the enrollment, and if you look, it wasn't quite what we were expecting. We uh, planned for four and it was 3.7. That's when I got my first, ooh, the enrollment's not always there as you plan. We better be working on retention and things. That was the first time that I was kind of surprised about that, but that's what the number was. So we put that up there and then we started moving forward. So uh, one other thing changed that summer at my retreat. Uh, a lot of my leadership team talked to me about the large campus budget committee that was giving input to this process. Uh, that it was a little clunky and it was hard for people to have input. So uh, I agreed to revise my budget process. I wouldn't do away with it, but I made a new committee called the Chancellor's Budget Advisory Committee, which is much smaller, just eight people, two students, two faculty, two staff, myself and Ty as there for the vice chancellors and then Alina is there for support. So uh, that was one change. Still the same uh, idea behind that budget committee, but smaller. And we're trying that as an experiment this year. 
And then I want to just throw this in there. I don't think we have time to look through this, but the president came out last October and did a budget or a financing uh, presentation, which I thought was fantastic, and I told everybody to go watch that. How many watched it? Oh, good. If you haven't, you should go watch it. Uh, I'll just show you quickly. What she did was showed uh, the pie, where they get all their money, and then went through very quickly what the state and tuition does for them. Uh, the reason I wanted to show it like this is this is all we get, essentially. We have tuition and an allocation. We don't have clinical enterprise. We don't have a $2 billion research machine here. So this is essentially what we have to work with on our campus. And if those things aren't robust, then that's all we have. And then she also showed these graphs, which I thought were really interesting. This is the state funding, and this is tuition. So you can see we can't put this on families. When the state backs off, we can't just keep adding it to uh, what the students pay. So this is real. And then she showed where we are. Look her, where we are. We're way down here in the, with respect to the other schools. So it's good. It's good in some ways. It's good because uh, we pay less, our students pay less, but it doesn't put our universities in a very good spot when you get less money per student. And also look at our tuition. So you can't, we don't really compensate for that with high tuition. We're getting less per student from the state, and we have low tuition. No wonder you know, we can't make ends meet and hire it. So then the slide, I actually didn't put bullet points. We wrote a budget message. The Executive Budget Committee got together and wrote this kind of stern budget message <laughs> that essentially says, no new revenue this year. We are not going to do a lot of additional things this coming year. And we put this message out there and uh, I talked about it in front of all you at the town hall and that became kind of the plan uh, and then we began to work on the right sizing in those initiatives. So what happened to make this seem so quick? So that was a slide I showed you. What was the date on that slide? 12. Uh, so that was just last December. What happened between that point and now where we're doing, now all of a sudden we're doing adjustments, we're doing reductions? Well, I'm going to show you. Uh, a couple things happened. The results of our right sizing weren't exactly what we hoped for. Our enrollment numbers in the fall and our retention in spring and winter weren't what we hoped for. I was not persistent enforcing reallocation earlier. I hadn't set us off this year looking at reallocation and, and I haven't been as forceful as I probably need to in insisting that we really work hard on our alternative revenue generating uh, infrastructure on this campus. Now luckily we've done things and I, I think we can, we can engage that quickly and we have been engaging it, uh, but this is my fault. I, I haven't been doing this uh, enough. So here's what we did and I made this graph to try to show you. So this is the accountable part of everybody's budget. So we have seven of these academic units, and we have, I don't know, six or seven administrative units. So let's just pretend this one's me, and let's pretend that one is, is I see Raj sitting there, and I saw Rachel in the back, education and you know, School of Engineering and Technology. So we have these units, budget units on campus, uh, and they have their accountable portion of the budget, but then they have these summer revenues. Big pot of revenue that we get, is it called golf? What's, yeah, golf funding that we get that we distribute. My office got quite a bit. When I got here, my office got like $280,000 a year of that summer revenue. Uh, Ty's office got some, Mintha's office got some, Jill's office got some. So we were distributing that to areas, but not necessarily holding people accountable for it. So what we were gonna do and what we did do is we swept that away and brought it over here centrally and then what we did is redistribute it to the units. Jill and Ty sat down very carefully with each academic unit and has been working on readjusting their budgets by using these summer money, giving them to the unit, but then we're going to hold the units accountable for that entire budget now. Okay. 
And it won't matter to you if it's summer money or if it's the, the general funds, tuition or whatever, you're gonna get one budget we're gonna hold you accountable for. But the issue was, who knows what the issue was? Look at the size of those two things. What we consolidated didn't go far enough. You know, I gave up in my office, I gave up $120,000 to the process, so my little thing is, is way bigger or way smaller than it was when we started. But when we went to some of the academic units, we had not funded the academic units appropriately over time. So that actually took more of the money than we started with. So our gap, our, our margin got substantially used up by this gap. We had to give that money uh, to make those budgets whole. So the money we set aside to build that margin, the nice pretty graph that that Ty and the, and the Executive Budget Committee had worked on where we were going to spread the margin, remember, it was going to be 4% going forward, and we would have some breathing room. Well, we used up a lot of that during right-sizing. Uh, and I, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to start going quick. I did a quick calculation here, though, to show you what happens with 1% less retention or enrollment. Uh, if you just take 1%, times the number of students, that's 54 students, multiply that out times uh, the tuition they pay for three quarters, that's $615,000. So what's happened is $615,000 less has come into the hopper, plus when we do our budget next year, it's gonna be $615,000 lower, and we can only expect $615,000 less coming in. That's a $1.23 million effect right there, which is 1% change. Uh, and with no margin or a very small margin, you can't accommodate things like this. So uh, our current projections last fall were that, but unfortunately, this is where we are right now. We're right there. No getting around it. So I want to show you one more thing, and then we'll kind of quit, is this was the situation three years ago. Now, I've changed the headings, and this is the dollars. This is our actual budget. So this is going back to that graph that uh, Jan and Richard had made for me, but instead of making a table, I actually put it into a graph here. So if we had done nothing two or three years ago to our budget, we would have crossed over this year. You know, we stretched it out a little bit. And we're crossing over this coming fall. This is what would happen. We would be extremely far behind. But with the right sizing effort that we've been working on, this was how the result would be based on the work that we did. However, did you see how it jumped up? The right sizing effort took more of our golf funding than we thought to make the budgets whole. So we have a smaller margin up there. And then the enrollments and retention this past year are much less. So that's the situation. And we had our budget meeting in, uh, Seattle last Tuesday, and uh, the way they referred to this is you have razor thin margins at UW Tacoma, uh, so they are very reluctant to let us do anything new because this is the situation we have right now. Uh, and I don't like that situation to be in that situation, but this is reality. So this is where we are right now, but we do have a plan, so that's what we're going to do. Our plan is first we're doing reductions in the central administrative units. Uh, and Ty has led the way with this uh, since he's been here. He has believed his organization was a little bit, um, not top heavy, but uh, he had uh, spare capacity in his organization and he took the lead uh, and did a reduction in his organization. So the rest of the administrative units are following suit. We're working almost every day on that and over the next two, three, four weeks, we'll be finished with that, and we will do efficiency gains in all of our administrative areas uh, on this campus, and then we'll talk to you about that in May, um, maybe sooner, but probably it's gonna be May before we get that done, uh, and that will help us be at this spot. Then what I wanna do is I'm gonna push, like I have been, but a little harder, on us taking more into our own hands, generating revenues through our auxiliary enterprises, our retail operation, our educational outreach, our out-of-state student enrollment, all those kinds of, kinds of things. I'm gonna start making myself uh, annoyable or whatever, and that's not the right word. I'm gonna make myself, uh, 
what am I going to make myself? <laughs> yes, I'm going to do that. So uh, anyway, I'm going to do that. And then we're going to ask the academic units to do what we're doing next year, to look at their internal structure. And we're going to look at every single faculty position and make sure uh, before we renew a faculty position that this faculty position is going to contribute to our academic planning going forward. So that's kind of what we're, we're doing. So let me uh, just kind of close with this, uh, these two summary slides. We are going to carefully move through this. We're moving through it as we speak. What, the way we did it is we asked each area to propose one and a half, two and a half, and four percent reductions. So we all kind of put that on the table. If I had to reduce half a percent, this is what I reduce. And then we talked about that, uh, and we shared what the effects would be, and we made some uh, suggestions, and we're working on that right now. Uh, we're expect, I'm going to expect, and I think the rest of the leadership team will be too, all hands on deck with respect to uh, whatever our enrollment development plan is for, for the coming years and our retention plan. Uh, there won't be an excuse. Everybody is going to work on this together. Uh, we'll expect all hands on deck with respect to moving forward with any revenue generating activity and we'll stay strong and focused on student success. That's our mission. We're going to do these things. We're going to continue to work on the strategic plan. Uh, we'll work on our initiatives, but then we'll ask the rest of campus to go through this exercise next fall and we'll continue to advocate the UW. We made a little headway about, from them about letting us go out on our own and asking the state to better support our campus. Uh, and we feel like we have uh, built relationships with our community and with our legislature that that could be successful going forward. So we uh, hope under the new provost to be able to go do that and we'll work collaboratively, and we'll build strong community support, uh, and we'll move everything forward. So I was going to show a few more slides, but I think I better stop and give people uh, an opportunity to ask questions. I do have some more slides if we need to show them, but essentially the rest of my slides are going to show you uh, what I showed last month about if you leave me in place, the things I would like to do going forward, uh, and I would still like to do those things, so we'll save that for another day. Okay. Questions, comments? My goodness. I think a mic is coming. Hi, I'm, I'm an ACCESS student. I feel very guilty for uh, actually uh, not supporting the university more in terms of tuition. Um, but the long and short of it is, it seems we need more revenue. Yes. And, um, and so, uh, how much of this are we allowed to just go out and get community contributions, get state contributions, get federal contributions, get corporate contributions? Is, um, how, how, uh, how is that being milked? Um, you know, can, can we put some manpower, yay, volunteer, behind that effort? Thank you. Yes, uh, to, to answer that question, yes, we do have a campaign which is very successful. We've extended our campaign from 45 million to 55 million. A campaign, though, those are primarily one-time monies, uh, and they're for specific purposes. So you can't really sustain campus growth out of a campaign. Now, we do build our endowment, but the endowment primarily funds specific things such as scholarships or a professorship or something like that. But the part of your, uh, part of your comment was very, all of it was well taken, but part of your comment was very clear to what we need to do for. We need to go directly to our state and see if our state would be willing to step up. Uh, they haven't done that in the past. Uh, we have a request in there right now for two new programs. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We have asked the state through the university to uh, backfill some of that compensation money. Because see, that's part of the problem. Is over the past three budget cycles, they've authorized way more uh, salary increases than they've paid for. So that's just like taking a cut every time. We all see it as, a, as an increase, but it's like taking a cut. They, they say pay everybody 3%, and we do, but they only give us 1% of that. Can you, can you see how that takes you further down? Yeah, so thank you for that comment. Yes. So something I've been wondering, yes. um, 
Given the, the large increase in Running Start students in 2017, you know, what we talk about is sort of the balance of students coming in versus students who leave and students who graduate, right? There's sort mm -hmm. of an in and an out. And some very large number of freshmen coming in are actually graduating in two and a half years instead of four years. And so I'm wondering if that has an effect on the budget. Um, it's kind of a weird thing because I'm not suggesting that we would sort of do something to change that, but to better understand the situation. Do we know if that has any effect on the overall budget? Uh, and, and of course it does. Uh, that calculation that I did to show the results of 1% less in student credit hours, that was a little bit real for this year. So uh, our budget is not based on how many students we have in the fall. It's based on how many we have all three quarters and how many credit hours they sign up for. Uh, and if they're here a shorter amount of time, yes, they don't pay tuition after they, they leave. So it has effect on it, but we plan for that. We do plan for that. Uh, but what, what that tells you though is we need to have more students coming in uh, if we're going to operate a campus that's designed for 5,380 students. You know, we, we can't have a campus that's designed for this size uh, and then operate on 4,000 students. Now, one of the things I think we're set, I think we're set really well right now. Our, our student to faculty ratio, uh, it's advertised as 16, but I went and tried to calculate this morning and I think it's more like 15 and a half. Uh, and really, our student to faculty ratio should be at least 18, if not 20, for a campus like this. So what we need to do is hold tight and make sure we have faculty in the right areas where we have student demand and not increase that, but bring students in and fill the empty seats is kind of what we need to do. We don't need to turn students away that can't get into certain programs. Other questions? Well, let me ask you a question. What do you think we should do about this? I'll give you the, the mic. What, what do you think is a campus? Yes, right over here. What would you like to see us consider? So what I'd, I'd like us to consider is when we discuss the avocation piece of it, how do we organize that as a community? Because I think the more voices we have going down to Olympia and talking about how UW Tacoma is not just a footprint, but our impacts here urban-wise and who we're really serving, I think is, it comes from many voices over many programs. How do we organize that as a community? And, and that being strategic. Yeah. And that's a good point. And we have a pretty good system in place. Uh, you may know that, that Mike Wark, who works in uh, advancement, works with me, works with my advisory board, works with Impact Washington. Uh, we do have a pretty, guy, good, pretty good organized system in place now, and we've been advocating like crazy for our new academic building and the civil and mechanical engineering. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the provost came right at the time that the U has already decided on what it was going to take forward for this year. So we couldn't change all of a sudden and say, oh, in addition to this, we want more central funding. But we feel like there's a little bit of wiggle room for us to do that in the coming years. So I guarantee you, we will organize the community, all of you behind that. We'll take advisory board members, we'll take our students. Our students are very active in that process. Uh, it, the, the big thing will be getting the permission to do that. That will be harder than us organizing around it. Good question. But that's two years off too, so we have to, we have to continue. We have to continue right now making our current operation more efficient, holding tight. A lot of good things to do, but uh, if they cost money, new money, we can't do them all. We can, we can reallocate money. We can do that if you have an idea and you can also know where we can go get the money from and stop doing something else. We'll take any of those ideas. And we may have to do some of that with respect to our retention and enrollment efforts going forward. What else do people think about this? If you don't tell me what you think about it, then you're stuck with what I think about it. 
And you're okay with that? Maybe he's not okay with that. Good. Thanks. I know there's challenges with bringing on international students and mm -hmm. housing and all of those things. My question is that in out of state, what's the strategy or if we look at the mix for the long term, can we improve this over the long term by building those capabilities, maybe partnering with others to improve our international admissions? Where, where does that fit in the mix for the long term? Yes, yes we can. And that was a, the subject of a, a future slide I was gonna show here. Uh, last month I, I did ask that we consider those. Those were just numbers I threw out there. And they were based on what we are now and what I think is is okay inside of the constraints of our mission. You know, it could be somewhat controversial to uh, recruit students from out of state when UW Tacoma was built for this region. But I think we have room if we maintain the seats that we have for Washingtonians that are ready for action at the UW Tacoma. We've worked on that college going culture. We maintain our doors open for that base of students. We don't turn anybody away who is uh, academically prepared to come here. We keep that strong, but then add to that a few more students from the out of state and a few more international students and put in place what we need to support them. I think that is something we have to do. Uh, and we have a plan coming forward from uh, uh, SAES, Student Affairs, Student Enrollment Services right now, and we're gonna act on that plan. You're gonna see us all get right behind what we decide as a whole. And remember last month, were you here last month when I was talking about this? Uh, remember what I said, is these are kind of Mark's ideas, but I've created a, a um, shared governance structure where I want all of us to be in on this, and that's kind of why we're in this position right now, because I've probably erred too much on the side of taking input, and that's why I didn't do reallocation sooner, is because the campus really wasn't ready yet. Uh, we were in this growth mode going forward, and people didn't see the reason for that, but now we're here and we gotta do them. Uh, same thing with this. We're at that point in time, we have to be organized about what we're gonna do with respect to enrollment, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Thank you. Wait till the microphone gets there. of doing an, a very deep inventory so we understand where our students are coming from. I think in so many years past, the composition has changed, we made assumptions about who's attracted to UW Tacoma, who's remaining at UW Tacoma, so on and so forth. This year, we've actually taken the time to drill down into that information and be a little bit more thoughtful. The other piece of it is, this is a want, right? But there are certain conditions that have to be in place in order for us to be successful. So certainly, we can go out to a number of places and bring in international students. The question becomes, do we want them to be successful? So at the end of the day, our success strategy is looking at a holistic approach. So over the course of the next few months, you will hear very involved, in-depth conversations led by Carl um, Smith, who's taken a look at a variety of indicators and given some sense of what our capabilities are. In addition to that, the success strategy, the retention strategy. When we spring students in, I believe we have a responsibility to support them so they graduate. So all of this will be discussed, but it can't be done by one department or one individual. It's gonna take our village. And so my hope is that everyone who's in this room will go back to their departments, their coworkers, their colleagues, what have you, and really have a thoughtful conversation about how it's gonna take all of us to make this engine happen. Was that helpful? Thank you. Uh, th Recommendations this, can come my way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is, right here is part of the, the good news. The, the thing I'm really excited about is you heard Mintha very clearly talk about uh, what's going to happen going forward. Uh, we have a leadership team now that is all poised, that's uh, on the same page with all these things. I mean, we don't have the details worked out, but we have a leadership team that wants to move the campus forward. Uh, you recall... Let me see. This statement, remember our aspirational statement? Uh, as long as we're sticking to, to this statement, uh, we can all move forward together and we have a team. Uh, and this is not just based on the, the 10 or so people that drafted it. It's based on what they understand the campus as a whole and including our community around us want this institution to be. So we are gonna be what you all want us to be moving forward. We just have to get our uh, financial situation sustainable over the long haul. 
Jim, Professor Gao. Hi, Jim Gao. Um, my question actually, you mentioned something about the FTE ratio for uh, students to faculty. Yeah. And we've been asking for a while for what that should be, uh, partly to know that we're actually meeting a goal, but also to know when we have met that goal and we can actually stop asking mm -hmm. faculty to, te you know, that in units that are growing but not getting the faculty, they're basically getting higher and higher FTE ratios in their classes. And so it would be nice to know at some point what that target is so we actually can go forward with figuring out things like, you know, giving people a target and then saying, okay, you have the freedom to meet this target in different ways that might mean higher enrollments in some classes and lower in other places so that high impact practices can actually be worked into classes. But right now, we don't know what that is. And so occasionally we're told you're doing a good job, but that doesn't tell me enough to say that's a target that, you know, what we have right now is something we can use as a benchmark or something. Well, I love that question, uh, Jim. I, I love that question because that's exactly what I want us to do and what we've been trying to do. We have a strategic plan, but I've never been in a strategic plan uh, before that didn't have a set of benchmarks that you're trying to move the institution towards. So that has been very controversial among us. I think it's part of our culture in, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you have to be extremely careful about what you measure because it says a lot about your culture and your values. So we've tried to be sensitive to that and we're coming to the point where we are starting to have measures. You saw Joe's presentation last fall where uh, we are going to hold ourselves accountable. We're having some dashboards on things. We talked about this this morning. It would be helpful for us to also agree on aspirational partners. What kinds of schools do we want to emulate? Who should we be looking at? Or should we just decide this on ourselves? I just know that since I've been here, our student to faculty ratios have decreased a little bit. So what's happening is we're not being really good about getting the faculty positions where the students are coming in. So you probably feel it in some areas where faculty are overloaded in their classes and other places the faculty members may have seven or eight people in their classes. So I think what we have to do is just not add any new one until we get that figured out inside. That's something that's hard for me to do from my position. I have to depend on the, the faculty leaders and the deans and directors uh, and, and uh, Dr. Purdy to help do that. Hi, I'm Victoria Hill over in Financial Aid. And I just was wondering um, how, how your, about your retention strategy, actually. How involved is that? How deeply have you looked at it? Where, where are students going? Do we know? Have, is there, I know it's difficult often to pinpoint where, why students are leaving. But how much do we know about that? How are we, and do you have, I guess, a strategy moving forward to, for all of us as a campus to come together um, in, in retention efforts and what that looks like? Bonnie, did you want to answer that? Thanks for asking that. So this quarter we are working, so in addition to what's going on in student enrollment services and, and a lot of that really deep work that Carl is doing from the academic side of the house, we're also doing some very deep work around an academic retention plan. And um, the main thrust of that this quarter is an environmental scan. So we actually just met this morning about um, a set of data that have been available to us for a while, but sort of re imagining sort of how we're gonna look at it. So we do have data about students who have transferred and those kinds of things. Um, and there's a group of us working right now to, to really do a deep dive this quarter um, to be able to start answering some of those questions. So for example, we're also going to be doing a survey of students who have left and some focus groups around that. Um, so the real focus of the academic retention plan, environmental scan is more student oriented. And so we'll do our best to um, to, to communicate and make it clear sort of the direction that we're going, but really spending a lot of time focusing on the student data and student sort of qualitative approaches um, to shape that academic retention plan that we hope to have done um, in short order. Thank you. Uh, adding to that, one of the things we did uh, about this time last year, last March, we took uh, 10 people or 12 people uh, to Georgia State University. I had been in a conference earlier in the summer 
uh, and had the, heard a presentation of how they do retention uh, and recruitment and a, and a variety of things on their campus, one student at a time, and they have 50,000 students, and I was so impressed, I said, I gotta get more of the, the folks at UWT to hear about this, so we took a whole team down there and spent the day with them, uh, and got some good ideas, and I think that's part of what Bonnie is talking about is we're getting real serious about that one student at a time. Each and every student, we need to understand what's keeping them from moving forward. We put the emergency aid uh, in, in place if it's a financial reason, so we're working on that all the time, and we'll get all of you involved as, as we can moving forward. Any other comments or questions? I've had you for an hour. I will be happy to talk to any of you at any time about this, uh, be schedule appointment if you want to hear more. Uh, hopefully we can get this solved and get back on track uh, and move forward. So if there's no other questions, let's, um, let's adjourn for today. Thank you for being here. <laughs>